Welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. Just going to do a quick video today, a little bit of general commentary, having a look at a few things that uh, I found interesting. I'm going to go over this uh, paper put out by JP Morgan. Uh, it's a huge long paper. I'm just going to go through the executive summary and then um, and speak a little bit as to how that does or does not change a thesis regarding energy and the commodities bull market. So before we do that, I'll go into a, a quick overview. If we take a look at the performance uh, over the, the month, okay, so here's a bar chart of all the different uh, sectors. Energy got smacked the most this month, 15% down. Um, Spot prices haven't changed, but the producers have uh, sold off. A few different reasons for this. One is that they've already run quite hard. And so every now and then there might be some profit taking. Uh, quarterly and half annual, or depending on where you're in the world, maybe annual redemptions in hedge funds. Okay, so they um, have to get redemptions. They have to cash out uh, the investor. And so they have to sell off indiscriminately. indiscriminately. And so uh, that will certainly be playing a factor. And uh, as we've seen, the interest rates uh, continue to rise uh, the Federal Reserve uh, undergoing QT uh, at the moment. And so we will see broad assets sell off uh, around the world globally. And in times like this, where you have tightening credit, uh, the correlation of all different assets uh, goes pretty close to one really, except for maybe arguably cash. And so let's take a look, three month performance, energy, um, uh, down 6.9%. So it's holding up relatively well for the quarter. Half yearly, of course, we're, uh, we're up 21%. Um, and we've seen the rotation moving out of technology, mainly uh, very low cash flow producing uh, high multiple uh, stocks uh, have been sold off, mainly through the likes of ARK investment. And um, that's what happens when you have... Uh, a sell-off in the market, like, well, you have tightening credit in the market, you have sell-off um, first for that, which is not making a lot of cash because you have an opportunity cost of holding 10-year um, treasuries. For, for instance, if they're paying you 1%, then you might be able to bid up a technology stock that makes no money, or you may start to change your mind when you get closer towards a three handle on the 10-year, which is where we are. Real interest rates, uh, by that I mean to say nominal minus the rate of inflation are still negative, okay? So um, it still pays to be short uh, fiat and long tangible assets or cash flow producing assets for that matter. One year relative performance, uh, here you are, there's only a couple in the green uh, at the moment and that happens to be in energy. Uh, my fund is now almost 50% uh, by weight in the energy sector. Uh, mainly in oil and gas, but we also have um, about 5% towards uh, coal and then nearly 10% in uranium, which I am continuing to, to double down on in my uh, Etoro portfolio. In my uh, funds outside of that, I am very heavy, uh, heavily weighted into uranium. So uh, we will look at the screener in a moment. Uh, perhaps I'll go into groups and talk about why that is. So let's look at current valuations on a forward PE basis, very basic, but it's still, as I mentioned in the last video, you're looking at utilities as a number one sector, dangerous with that governments will come in and um, try and induce price controls, I believe, which is why I've steered clear of the utility sector. Energy is the next uh, best according to this particular metric. And then you have basic material and consumer cyclical. Uh, I'm wanting to build out more into my basic materials and uh, I'll talk as to why that is. That can kind of be a hedge on energy, but it's also a part of this um, next wave of uh, what I believe will be uh, infrastructure heavy in terms of governments around the world wanting to increase their, their standings. So if you take a look at the portfolio, um, doesn't look too flattering at the moment in terms of returns uh, over a short term period. Uh, it's a little bit annoying, but other than that, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be able to buy some of the best assets in the world at, at lower prices. Buying arch resources, for instance, at you know, a little bit over one times expected cash flows when you've basically got all these fundamental scenarios that are increasing the 
the floor of the, the, the Met coal price uh, in particular is a, a wonderful scenario. So here we have URA, uh, obviously the uranium ETF, Sonovus Energy, one of the leading producers and refiners with a merger and husky in uh, Canada, CF industry, world's best fertilizer producer, in my opinion. Uh, Glencore is everything to do with commodities. Um, they're, they're a behemoth. XOP is the ETF that tracks oil and gas production. So specifically earlier stages, those companies with a high amount of talk um, to the prices. I'm going to talk a lot about different uh, individual stocks that I own outside of eToro in another video, uh, mainly those that are unhedged uh, to some of the, their respective commodities that they sell. So moving on to the, the meat of today's video, which is going to be this, these three points here I think are extremely important. Uh, this is the executive summary. You can jump online, JP Morgan 2020 uh, energy market paper. Energy transitions differ sharply from transitions in technology, healthcare, and other sectors. Healthcare is also starting to look very attractive. Decarbonization of electricity is underway, but decarbonization of industrial production, transport, and heating lag further behind. So here's where it gets interesting. We are going to need a lot of infrastructure rebuilding in the developed and developing world. And when you look at the percentage, uh, so here's industrial, that brown part there is the percentage of energy inputs that is from fossil fuels. So where you're looking at this uh, renewables in terms of in, uh, industry, they require so much uh, from fossil fuels. So here's where I'm setting up the, personally where I'm setting up the portfolio and um, all, all the different portfolios that I have. Long energy, as you all know, I've been talking about that for ages. And so we'd be benefiting from both the rising energy prices, but there's such a margin of safety in these particular producers that should the oil price fall to, they're currently discounting about $55 WTR. So should the oil price fall to $70, uh, the average yield on my holding is about 18% free cash flow yield. So there's a humongous margin of safety there. And um, it's a cash flow investment. And at the same time, it's a net asset investment. Very... Uh, very good thing, in my opinion, and not often do you get the chance to do that. So this is on the one side. Then on the other side, I'm looking into more industrial type plays as a, as a potential hedge. Why do I say that? Well, if global uh, energy prices skyrocket, I'm making a heap of cash over here. And these guys will likely suffer in the intermediate to immediate term. Why? Because look at where their input costs are. Uh, if you've got fossil fuel prices rising, these guys, your producers of steel and infrastructure, um, they are, they're going to have a, a, tougher a much tougher time. Uh, you might even put you the, the, the metals miners into that basket because their cost of production will increase um, with energy inflation. Then on the other hand, uh, should these energy prices temper off a little bit, I've bought them at such a price that I'm still going to be very, very happy with the free cash flow yields. And I may make outsized returns with a few tailwinds. One would be the infrastructure boom, governments around the world wanting to put people to, uh, to work and improve their infrastructure, uh, basically to win votes. Two, because of the decrease in the input costs. So if energy prices come down, I don't see it happening, but uh, hypothetically, if that were to occur, their margins would start to increase. And thirdly, particularly where I like to look in the developing worlds, I'm looking at a lot of uh, Latin American companies as a market that I, I'm very interested in. You may have this, uh, you may have this reversion to mean of the, the US dollar cross rates around the world. So that might take quite a while to play out. I don't expect that necessarily to happen tomorrow, but eventually with the US being so indebted, there's only so far they can raise their rates. So, once we hit that point and they start to ease off on the quantitative tightening and the, the raising of interest rates, you're going to start to see a softening in the US dollar versus um, emerging market rates. And then I think the likes of uh, Stone Cold is not infrastructure, but it's payment processor, um, uh, National Steel Company of Brazil, uh, which uh, I own, I expect to do very well. Um, the Rios, the BHPs of the world, I believe will do. Uh, well, also, uh, and Glencore, of course, okay, who will benefit from energy price because they own everything, <laughs> whether it's uh, you know, metals uh, or energy, Glencore has basically got the tentacles and everything. 
Here, something else I want to look at. So, okay, the world uses fossil fuels for 83% of its energy. So after everything that we've done, we've taken that from like 86% to like 83% over the last 20 years. Okay, it's barely made a dent. And that's a little bit scary in, in the sense of where at this point where the leaders of the world have decided to transition without actually figuring out how we're going to do it. And so I think that we're going to see, or we're already seeing um, uh, some backtracking in terms of um, softening stances on what's considered ESG, uh, for instance. So <laughs> magically with these uh, fossil fuel producers producing a heap of, uh, of profit, uh, gas all of a sudden looks a little greener than, than most people used to, <laughs> to consider it. Okay, so moving on, uh, you guys can obviously read this. So I won't, I won't belabor the point too much, but intensive energy manufacturing to the emerging world is a percentage of global production. And you can see how that trend is starting to move uh, across various different uh, industries. So manufacturing ammonia, which is essentially fertilizer, steel, cement, plastics. Uh, the bar on the left, 1998, versus uh, the bar on the right, which is either 2020 or 2021, depending on the given industry, shows how much of that production has left developed markets and moved over to uh, emerging economies, which is uh, which is exciting, I guess, for emerging economies as long as they manage that transition well. But opportunities like cement, steel, um, that sounds a hell of a lot like... Um, uh, CID, which uh, the Portuguese name, Copenia Cidiologica Nacional, is the Brazilian Steel Corp. These guys, I believe, are the types of businesses that are going to do very, very well. They trade at like single PEs and they dish out a hell of a lot in terms of dividends, like double digit dividend returns. So uh, this, is where, this is where I'm looking. Projected change out from 2020 to 2050 is the blue line here. You'll see Latin American is here. India have very favorable demographics. Um, but difficult place in which to invest. A lot of bureaucracy, and it's uh, it's a very closed. Uh, it's very closed to outside investors. India. India is also a service economy that has to import a lot of its energy, which means that can be a that can be a bit of a trap. Whereas Latin America, they uh, have a, a rising um, a rising level of education amongst the workforce. Proximity to the United States, great port access, and they have a lot of natural resources, so they can move stuff in and out, and are, um, are less dependent on um, on energy imports. For instance, Latin America has a lot of political volatility, so you know nothing's for free. Africa is a potential powerhouse, which we all know has great demographics, but it's Africa, so anything can happen. Here we've got a percentage of energy consumption. Um, and if you look at this, this is uh, for coal, okay? So if you think coal is going away, uh, you're out of your mind, basically. I mean, I look at the ability to buy business and have return of invested capital in two years, uh, for instance, which, had a lot of, which a lot of the coal uh, companies uh, have. The previous video, I mentioned the fact that essentially, if you're looking at a free cash flow to enterprise value yield of, call it three years for the Canadian oil and sands place, the market is betting um, or it, it is the pricing is such that the market believes they're going out of business in three years. <laughs> Read this paper. Okay. That's not going to happen. Here we've got, uh, you can, you can do all of this and um, don't need to belabor the point there. Uh, free cash flow in the billions uh, has since uh, turned around, obviously. So this has been a, uh, a product mainly of the majors uh, or all companies in their, their oil space, instead of increasing uh, CapEx, moving their, their focus more towards shareholder returns. Okay. And let's take a look. Oil supply assuming no new development. So if we continue at the rate in which we are, where you've got, particularly in Canada, but in the United States as well, where you have these oil producers that are refusing to make the same mistakes essentially as 2014, 2015 uh, sh in the shale boom where they just levered up and it was just all about high grading and drilling as much oil as they could possibly get their hands on and growing by volume and production as opposed to, you know, this little thing called profit and margins. 
here we've got <laughs> the capex being uh, reduced to just a, a minimum a sustained minimum and so according to this we are going to have a humongous uh, supply deficit there's a great interview uh, eric nuttle did with uh, one of his consultants i forget the lady's name but uh, i listened to it twice it was super super engaging showing how saudi aramco can pump as much as they possibly can which over a three-month period might be the equivalent of 10 and a half million barrels a day and we're not going to make up any kind of uh, any kind of ground on the supply deficit until like 26 27 2026 2027 wow. it's just it's just incredible at the moment energy sector is still trading uh, at only nine times forward earnings which is pretty crazy given the run-up that we've had and uh, versus the average of 16 and a half since 1990 so the historic average is uh, price you pay for every dollar of earnings in the sector is usually been about 16 and a half and you're able to buy uh, next year's earnings um, uh, a dollar of next year's earnings at $9.50 currently across the sector as an average. Energy sector trades at one time book value and is an inflation hedge for reasons which I've mentioned. Capital intensive, that's the downside and less sensitive to wages. Um, I'm not sure what he means by less sensitive to wages. I think a lot of these guys are very sensitive to wage pressure, which means, uh, which is, is further uh, bullish sentiment is required for the oil price. I mean, if you have a, a capital intensive business and a labor business for you to divert that cap, uh, divert that free cash flow from returning to shareholders into drilling more uh, wells, you better be sure you're going to get the price that you want. And so these guys are going to wait until the oil price continues to rise before the supply starts to come online for those reasons. So I, I'm not sure what he means by less sensitive to wages. I, I don't agree. These guys are extremely sensitive to wages um, and they're extremely capital intensive businesses. That's just how it is. This is the big one. So energy sector is only currently 4% of the S&P. So 2020, it went down to about 2%, which was ludicrous. And so if you're looking at all the capital in the world and how much of that goes into different sectors, it's very much about anticipating where the money flows are going to be. So if you have a 20 year average of 8% um, of the energy sector making up the, the S&P, 4% uh, it doesn't stretch the imagination to say that we could get back to a, a 20 year reversion to the mean, especially when the conditions now we have a much tighter supply market than we did 20 years ago. And for those of you who are worried about a recession uh, tanking the price of oil, that, that, that price is already priced in. Uh, if there weren't, weren't the recession fears, I do believe oil would be trading closer to 180, $185 a barrel uh, WTI right now. So a reversion to the energy sector as a whole uh, coming up to about 8% of uh, the S&P is, is certainly not a stretch. I, I do agree that that's highly feasible. Some people would say that's inevitable. Uh, okay. Um, this just talks about how renewable energy is a lie, basically. Um, you can read that because you won't believe me unless you read it. And but, 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 we don't need to belabor this point. Oh, this is very important. So US natural gas, uh, the gap at um, natural gas this is very important. So if you read Go Rosen's quarterly one report, you will know that they believe the gas crisis is expected to come to the US uh, in the third to maybe fourth quarter of this year. Europe has already been trading at gas levels roughly equivalent to $300 uh, a barrel of oil. Okay, so if you look at the European prices here, $32. Since everything kicked off with Russia, things have just gotten worse in terms of gas supply, right? So if you're looking at dollars per millions of British thermal units, which is what this chart is, $32 is what they're paying over in Europe because they can't really produce much on their own. They import it all, okay? UK, similar boat. US is different because they're a large producer. So if you look at Henry Hub uh, in Louisiana, the price is $8. So the, uh, the US gets gas for $8 per million British thermal units, whereas Europe has to pay $32. Obviously, that is a humongous difference. 
where we're at in terms of uh, the policies of the current administration in the United States really restricting and making it difficult for oil and gas production in the US, the US has gone from being a, a net exporter to a net importer. And the, the gas prices have gone through the, the roof, even in the US this year, we're getting to the point where they, being the US and other places around the world, are running out of excess capacity in which they can ship to Europe. And so Europe is completely reliant on a nation called Russia, and the Russians uh, are continuing to sell the gas, okay? So if you thought that sanctions were doing anything, again, you're out of your mind. That will start to change as of end of August, and where you've got gas supplies uh, running out both in Europe and in the United States, the US is going to choose to keep their own gas um, for domestic consumption to try and keep the price down, and eventually that will run out. So we may well see um, this convergence of gas prices where Henry Hub will start to look a lot more, will start to be a lot more reflective of global prices. And so uh, I own different contracts and different ways of playing this. XOP, the index that I mentioned before, would be one of them. UNG, an exchange traded note, is also another, and options on the two, okay? Uh, all right, I'm really talking a lot more than I wanted to, but here is, uh, I guess we'll make this the last, uh, the last point here. So steel, marine shipping, mining and metal, mining and metals and oil and gas producers. This is the energy and collapse of energy uh, intensive industries. So what this is uh, measuring is the expected investment levels in all these industries mentioned on the graph versus 10 years ago. So where you've got these large downward facing uh, bar graphs is the reduction in investment and in capital expenditure in pr production in these industries. So when you have reduction in capital expenditure, supply starts to dwindle, eventually that goes offline and hey, we need oil and gas, no one's been drilling, whatever the remaining supplies is worth a hell of a lot more. Okay, economics 101. Gee, this looks very familiar to what I've been talking about for about two years. Let's have a look. So steel, we own steel, marine shipping, we've been talking about shipping, mining and metals, uh, we own that. I think the opportunity for metals is certainly coming uh, even closer to load up. I've got about 25% uh, waiting in the eToro portfolio in cash to load up. Oil and gas producers, uh, I've spoken about left, right and center because I believe that's the, the, the circulation system for, for all of this. Here we talk about um, global supply. So it's very important that you read that. I won't go through it right now. You're quite capable of doing that, I am sure. Industrial use we've spoken about, and we'll talk about, I think that'll probably do us for today. So I hope you enjoyed that guys. Quick overview, very important paper in which to read. Um, the energy sell-off as far as I'm concerned is noise and I'm continuing to accumulate and buying a hell of a lot more. And um, 25% of portfolio in Toro in cash. I have a, a war chest of cash available for me to use in outside uh, my outside funds. And so, It'll be interesting to see what happens. I think that we may see the oil price continue to drop a little bit in terms of the spot price in, in the interim. And then looking forward to Q3 and Q4, it'll be interesting to see uh, what the Federal Reserve does. Will they be able to continue their, um, their QT or will they be first to, if not forced to, if not reverse course, will they have to soften the pace? And I think if you get to that stage, that'll be the time to, for me at least, to to load up even more in terms of the metal side of things. I'm already very well positioned in terms of energy. I think that commodities then will really start to, to rip. All right, thanks for watching guys. A disclaimer, none of this is advice, okay? It's just, as you know, this is my opinion on this channel. I put my thoughts out there. I share what I'm doing, um, doesn't mean it's right. And what's right for me may not necessarily be right for you, okay? So please don't mistake any of this as advice. Uh, having said that, I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you in another video shortly.